What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another exciting episode of Fed Watch. My name is Ansel Linder, and I'm here with my co-host, CK. How are you doing, CK? Doing good, Ansel. How Sorry, you doing, my man? Dog. What a time to be alive. You got a party over there. Yeah, sorry. My kids just came home from school. The dog is barking. I'm having internet issues. My wife works from home too, so I can't reset the internet right now. And it is uh, it is kind of crazy madhouse over here. But uh, that's just like it is in the macro space, right? Everything is going crazy around the world. It is a crazy madhouse. That is for sure. That is for sure. So, uh, I mean... Let, we're we're going to get to it before before we do though i got to give a, a like a crazy nod uh just announced on bitcoin magazine's twitter account breaking el salvador's president to slam ruling financial elite and media in upcoming bitcoin magazine print exclusive stay tuned so um pretty big news a lot of people Whoa. really hyped about the most recent issue of the bitcoin magazine the censorship resistant issue but Coming very soon is the next issue with President Bukele slamming financial elite as announced by Bitcoin Magazine today. So some pretty huge news right before uh, right before we jumped on. Is he going to name names from the IMF and the WEF and all those players? Uh, I don't know. I don't know uh, the details, you know. <laughs> They they keep they keep the exclusive stuff away from me, so this is news to me. But I mean, obviously, extremely exciting and, and absolutely huge. Also, in other housekeeping, Ansel and I are gonna go hang out for the first time for real. We we shook hands a couple times, hi bye, but we're gonna yep. hang out for real this Saturday at Bitcoin Day in Nashville. Ansel, I'm excited to get you over here. I'm excited to to hang out. I'm excited to MC. There's a bunch of really awesome talks. I know you're giving a great talk. Uh, Dylan LeClaire is giving a great talk. Robert Breedlove, just so many people. And like we mentioned on the show, uh, an amazing speaker to audience member ratio. So you're going to be able to hang out with us just the same. So go to Bitcoin Day. If you're in Nashville area, use promo code BTCMAG10 to save yourself 10% off. Ansel, passing it to you. What do you want to say? Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, so my talk is going to be a little fireside chat about macro from a contrarian perspective. So I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be, you know, a lot of audience interaction. And um, yeah, the all I can't believe the guest list. I mean, the, or the speaker list. The speaker list is crazy. So if you guys have not bought your tickets, you need and you're in any, pretty much anywhere in the Midwest. I mean, I'm driving nine hours in my old jalopy. So you guys can make it if you're within half a day's travel of Nashville recommend using that promo code and getting a ticket today. There's still some available. So excited, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited. got to say go to Bitcoin Amsterdam that is coming up in a little bit more than a month as well. Promo code BM live. Y'all we got a lot to talk about. Speaking yes. of Amsterdam and Europe, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're well, yeah, we'll, in Europe. There's a lot to talk about there. I mean, I think you got some more charts to get to first, but uh, back to you, Ansel. Yeah, we'll be diving into the European energy crisis a little bit. Um, is it as bad as people say? We're going to take a look at some contrarian takes from uh, Andreas Larson. I believe it's Larson uh, from the Blockworks Macro with Macro Alf. He's been tweeting. So we're going to take a look at some of his tweets. And I invited him on. And he should be, come, be, be able to come on the show in the next couple of weeks. So we'll get his insider take over there from, from the European market. But we're, yeah, we're going to go through a few charts, look at some energy, look at some currencies. And then, you know, the 20th Party Congress is coming up for China. And we've been talking a lot about China over the last year and a half, two years. Um, and I thought we should just take a look, take a look at what this socialism, what is it? Socialism with Chinese characteristics. What is that all about? Uh, so I have a few, I have an article that we're going to go through about China prior to Xi Jinping getting his unprecedented third term as premier. So yeah, jam-packed show. Should we jump into the charts? Let's do it. All right. Number one is- We also need Bitcoin. to make Chris FOMO yeah. into Bitcoin Day IO. We also need to get Chris to film the win. But Chris, come on down, man. Come hang out. All right. Sorry, Ansel. 
Yeah, so we are here starting on Bitcoin as usual. And what was the word I used last week, Christian, to describe the chart? Do you remember that? Wait, one more time. What was the word I used last week to describe the Bitcoin chart? Oh, flaccid. <laughs> oh, man. Flaccid. Feel that way. There is no green pump in this chart whatsoever. Uh, but okay. as you can see, that I mean, this is not a logarithmic scale. I actually put it on normal scale. Uh, so these dips look that have just happened seem a little bit smaller, but they, uh, you know, it does look like it's kind of flattening out if you ask me. And there, the Bitcoin news cycle has been somewhat slow over the last few weeks. Macro has really taken off. So uh, we're going to take a look at some of the macro things that could be um, affecting Bitcoin or, you know, maybe affecting Bitcoin in the next few months uh, that could help Bitcoin uh, turn around. So if you go to the next chart, is the stock market. This is the U.S. stock market. And I've been talking about this Fibonacci retracement and we're still holding on to that. And if you look at a live chart, actually, because I snapshotted this a couple hours ago, it's it's already pumped even more than this. So we'll see if we can challenge that 50-day moving average, the blue line, uh, and really set that bottom in that golden pocket on the Fibonacci's. Um, I've been talking about that uh, Fibonacci retracement for a couple weeks now, and it seems to have hit. Um, again, I remain bullish on stocks for the rest of the year for multiple reasons that we've talked about here on the show. Um, and we'll see if this bounce is for real. Uh, but we can look at the European stock market. So let's go to the next slide real quick. Uh, this is the German stock exchange, the DAX. And it, it looks definitely bearish. If you go back one slide and then back to this one, you can kind of see the difference between this one is a little bit more bullish, obviously, than the German one. So go back to the German one, please. So then, yeah, there it, it just looks bearish. Uh, but it does look like there is some time left. And all the talk has been about winter, right? Is winter actually going to be super cold, uh, you know, get a bad winter, and that's going to be really bad for Europe? Or is it going to be a mild winter, and it's less bad? Well, this chart kind of says, well, looks like we do have until November to come to a decision point on stocks in Europe. So any comments on those before I jump into the dollar? Um, it'll be really interesting to see a scenario where Bitcoin is tanking and US stocks are pumping. But I'm starting to think that as much as we love Bitcoin, in the oh, eyes man. of many, it is still a speculative store of value and speculative uh, future uh, utility. I think a lot of us, we see the details, we see the growing utility, we are excited about it. But uh, to the eyes of many stocks, real estate, a lot of these other things, they're just more comfortable with it. And I think, hey, that sucks that Bitcoin isn't there yet, but that's Bitcoin's future. That's the way that Bitcoin will, you know, work with society when there's times of chaos or fear or change. You know, Bitcoin will be that that trusted store of value that people find in other assets today. Yeah, but you can't do international settlement with real estate, right? I mean, no, that, you, I, I agree the the, yeah. the real utility will continue to set it apart. But in this moment, in the fear right now, you know, uh, Bitcoin is a very liquid thing to dump. Right. And yeah. I just don't I just don't know uh, when the mental psychology completely flips gradually and suddenly. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I do see that, well, from my vantage point, watching the Bitcoin news cycle, because uh, I write my newsletter every Friday, it's actually switching to Monday. After 200 issues of the fundamentals report, I'm switching it to Mondays. But um, it is, I've noticed that the news cycle has slowed down. There, I, there doesn't seem to be any like huge amount of supply coming on the market to dump. It is just smaller fish, you know, I, I can't hold on through this. I'm getting too bearish and they're dumping a little bit of their, their stack. So I don't see a huge amount of supply coming on. All I see out there on the horizon, at least, is potential huge demand from people like BlackRock, Fidelity, Vanguard, um, all of those players, also nation states. I mean, not just El Salvador, but Russia now is reengaging with the idea um, they're they're starting to use other currencies in settlement with China. So it would work uh, if they said, hey, Bitcoin is one of those settlement currencies. So there is all this potential demand out there and I don't see as much potential supply. But 
Uh, that's just me. Uh, a, per a permable, I guess you could say. I, I am as bullish as you can get. I, I'm on the record of calling out Bitcoiners for not being bullish enough, but uh, I, I do like to talk about the market dynamics that I sense when talking to people. You know, mm -hmm. I, I really do take the anecdotal information I get from my conversations with, you know, Bitcoiners peop and, and people that I meet in, in just real life. Uh, and I try to let that inform, uh, you know, inform my analysis. Of course, uh, I Absolutely. also like to to get the big picture macro. And obviously there's this avalanche of demand that's coming, but uh, <laughs> when that is going to come, that's where I think we, it's always good to try to take some heuristic data points as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's go to the next slide here. Cause this has a lot to do with this is the strong dollar. So Chris, if you could go to number four, please. This is taking yeah, he's a look ahead of us. What a killer. I'm still showing us being on the DAX. Uh, yeah, sorry. W which chart again? Chart number, number four? four. Yeah. Slide number four, please, Chris. Anyway, I'll just talk to it here. Um, we have the, it, it's the update to the chart that I showed last week with the DXY and the broad trade weighted dollar. Um, I kind of feel like I'm turning the dollar moderate here. I, I was a dollar bull for a very long time before it was cool, I guess, before ever, anybody was talking about it. And now I'm kind of like, whoa, wait a second. Now the, the DXY is blowing out, not because necessarily the dollar is strengthening for the monetary reasons that I noted back in the day. I said, you know, there's deflationary pressure. There's going to be a dollar shortage, et cetera, et cetera. I think right now the thing is people are dumping the euro and they're dumping the yen. Um, so that's why the DXY is really blowing out where, when you look at the broad trade weighted dollar, yeah, it's just hit another local high, but it's still below its COVID crash peak. So, um, the, the main strength of the dollar is coming from the weakness in the Euro and the yen. And I did not include the yen chart. Um, but the yen did hit 145. So it sold off down to 145 against the dollar and also the 10 year uh, JGB or the Japanese government bond, that's the one that they try to peg, right? Between negative 0.5% and positive 0.5%. Well, it just went back above 0.5%. So now what they're having to do is sell yen and buy the 10 year JGB to push that yield back down. So they're dumping yen onto the market uh, to try to contain their yields and the yen is just, you know, crashing. So those are the updates I have for that. Also, Chris, are you there? Can we go to slide number eight? Chris is always there, Ansel. Never, never fear. <laughs> Am I frozen? Because I can't see the charts going. It, we're on it. We're on it. You are we're frozen. I am frozen. Okay. Well, the number eight is the... U.S. oil. This is the WTI oil, but it's also the the European oil or the the Brent crude is looks very similar to this. We broke down to new lows again. Uh, this chart is only showing, I think it's 83 on this chart. I'm not seeing it. Um, I must be frozen, but the I saw it as low as 82 right now. So the the oil price continues to go down, and it's like a really weird thing. How could this? You know, we're supposed to be having this energy crisis. We're supposed to be having all this inflation but oil keeps dropping. It doesn't make any sense. If you go to the next slide, number nine, that's the gasoline futures and they're falling as well. This is us gasoline futures. But if you go to the, uh, if you take a look at the European gasoline futures, like in Rotterdam uh, futures contracts or whatever, I don't have a slide for that, but um, it's very similar. They continue to fall. Uh, so it's, it's very weird. There's something weird going on here where, People are extremely, extremely bearish right now, but the charts really aren't playing that out. Uh, so Christian, do you have any thoughts on that before we go to the Andreas tweets? I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to put put the, the puzzle pieces together myself, so I don't have any good insight to add. Um, be very interested to hear what Andreas is saying, but uh, on one end, you're hearing crisis with the natural gas situation and other sort of energy mm -hmm. in Europe. And on the other hand, 
um, you know, gasoline futures are tanking. Uh, so uh, I guess not all energy is created equal, but would love to, uh, to continue diving into it. Okay. So if we go to slide number five, that is uh, the first one from Andres and he's been pointing this out, pointing out the energy situation for many months, almost a year here. So he says in this tweet, this is slide number five. For those claiming that I have, okay. For those claiming that I have not been on top of this energy crisis, here is a full, full blown warning from October 2021 on what was coming. Now I am fading the energy crisis, but I simply cannot accept being labeled as not having been on top of it early. So he's starting to feel the same way I am feeling about um, calling a strong, strong dollar. dollar. Yeah, yeah, calling a strong dollar. But now everybody seems to be more uh, bullish on the dollar than I am. Um, so if you go to the uh, number slide number six, let's get into this thread here. He had he's had had some myths that he was debunking about this energy crisis. So I wanted to go through this. We're on it. Okay. All right. Myth number one: Russia can't sell the gas to India and China. Or oh, sorry, uh, Russia can just sell the gas to India and China. No, roughly forty out of two hundred and fifty billion cubic meters are exported as LNG. But there are no pipelines from the huge fields north of Murmansk to anywhere else than Europe. It will take years for Russia to redirect flows. And this is one thing I said early on in the crisis that, um, you know, Russia was going to have to deal with this because there's no way that they could actually send this stuff to China. They have to put it onto ships and send it around the world. Right. And that that's not at all a substitute for these pipelines. They're all the industry is set up for pipelines. It's not easy for them just to load it onto these big container, uh, the LNG ships, if they can even get some and send it around to China. Um, so all of this stuff about China buying up the excess or India buying up the excess, that is totally false. That that's not happening. Um, also the, I was going to say something else about this chart. Oh, they said that to, I, I read elsewhere that to build these pipelines, even if they could build the pipelines and connect the infrastructure, they need these compressor, these big compressor engines along the pipeline to push, you know, all the liquid natural gas and oil through these pipelines. But Russia and China don't make those compressors. They're made by Siemens or, you know, made by German companies. So even if they could build the pipelines, in say a year or two, they wouldn't be able to get these compressors unless they got them from the West. So every, you know, globalization is totally interconnected and you can't just say, oh, Russia uh, can export to anybody there. Like I hear all these pundits out there saying, oh, we're, you know, commodities are over like Zoltan, like we talked about last week, commodities, the, the future is commodities, not uh, finance. Well, everything's interconnected. They, they can't just, export raw materials without getting financing it's it's kind of crazy so that's the first myth stop me whenever you want to jump in here christian so the second myth is the ruble is strong no the ruble is currently a one-sided trade as imports to russia have disappeared there is a huge discrepancy between russian uh, russia's reported imports and the export numbers published by their former trade partners Okay, so also uh, I've been saying that Russian CPI or their, their quote unquote inflation rate is, was 18% for most of this year. Well, where Europe's was, you know, eight, 9%. Now it's 10% plus or minus, but it's still not as high as Russia's inflation rate. It's just that Russia's used to that kind of high inflation, right? The, the ruble that you see traded um, is a very, very tiny market and really doesn't represent the strength of the ruble whatsoever. Okay, next slide. This is myth number three here. German so, gas German gas flows will go to zero. No, German gas flows are not going to zero. Germany has other suppliers and 0% flows from Russia will likely only lead German gas flows back to 2015 levels. Is that bad? Sure, it's really bad. Is it outright catastrophe? Probably not. So that puts it in perspective as well. The Russian share of European natural gas was, I think, like 40% before this crisis. So the, the flows aren't going to zero. Yeah, it's cutting it back 40%, but it's not going 
to zero, like a lot of people are claiming out there. Um, now, Germany is going to be hit harder than other European countries because they have industry like chemical, the chemical industry that they get from refining natural gas. And so um, that will be hit very hard as well, but it's not going to zero. Okay. That's just a very important thing that we need to realize. All right. Number five, or sorry, myth number four, I believe is uh, Russia can resell gas to Europe via China. Now, nah, China just bought 2.35 million uh, metric tons of LNG from Russia in the first half of the year. Europe bought more than 70 million tons of LNG in 2021. So on a good day, Russian reselling of liquid natural gas via China will make up 5% of Europe's LNG imports. That's peanuts. So once again, people are talking about China is going to benefit from this. China is doing everything right. China is so strong in Russia. They're doing, you know, they have the upper hand kind of, but it's almost like it just, they're four to six months behind where Europe is. You know, they're just hoping that Europe can't hold on through the winter, right? That's, that's where, where we're at right now. So then Andreas concludes, is Europe stuck in a mess? Yes. Is Russia stuck in a mess? Yes. Who wins this game of chicken? It very much depends on decisions taken by politicians in Europe. I don't hold high hopes, but I have seen moves in the right direction in recent weeks. Um, I haven't really seen that. Uh, I think they kind of are doubling down. But we have reported here on the show about the sanctions. And I read them, you know, the update on the sanctions from the Financial Times, which is supposed to be a reputable source where... So, for instance, uh, the UK was supposed to sanction insurance of these tankers and all these exports of wheat and all that from Russia. Well, they only applied those sanctions to the UK itself. So the UK companies will still insure these, all these tankers and stuff going around the world, just not to the UK. Uh, so that really was hard, tough talk, but they didn't deliver. Also, the European sanctions, remember... Um, they said they, the European companies couldn't do direct business with Russia, but they could do business with a third party, right? So there could just be a third, like an Indian company as third party or an Iranian company or whatever as third party, and it, it would just go through them like that. So, uh, yeah, I do see that maybe in the headlines, it's like, whoa, it's so crazy. There's this, you know, the end of Europe as we know it. But in the background, maybe they are working things out a little bit. So um, that's what I got, Christian. What, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's really, really interesting to kind of just see like the pendulum swing on sentiment and how it like tends towards like extremes before readjusting. Um, I think that's one of the things we pride ourselves on the show most about is trying to kind of like get ahead of that. One is like be, you know, point point the listeners in the right direction before uh that you know happens and then also mm -hmm. like when we start changing directions to uh, be honest about it so um these are things that were known about the energy situation as well like that it would be difficult for russia to deal with it it's also very difficult to like once you are producing natural gas it's really hard to stop so if you're not like selling it it's hard and then when you stop it's really hard to get started. So any of these moves is like they're making year decisions out for months and years. Right. Um, and that can cost millions and billions for uh, for economies in both directions. So it's a very, very tricky situation. And then lastly, you know, him concluding that um, the solutions will have to be political and from Europe, uh, man, it's. What a mess. I would not want to, yeah. you know, we're trying to get to a world where we're less reliant on politicians, but here we are and it most re more reliant than we ever were, especially in Europe. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, it, it takes years or whatever to get these rigs back going again, to get the infrastructure set up. And it's the same with companies in say Germany, right? That shut their doors because they don't have access to, um, not the electricity is too expensive. Plus they don't even have access to their raw materials. So um, that, that will take years to get over that, that economic damage that they're doing to themselves. So that's what I have for Europe. Are we ready to jump into China? Well, I mean, before we, we close it out, like 
I guess yep. the UK isn't quite Europe, but the new uh, the new prime minister of the UK is talking about like insane subsidies and price caps and annual payment caps per household and taking big energy profits and reinvesting it into individuals like massive, massive socialization efforts. The very mm -hmm. following day, the president of the ECB talks about um, we're all in it together to curb energy uses at peak times and to like fight through this and really trying to coordinate, uh, you know, around things like that. And we're already seeing uh, countries committing to uh, being a part of this action. I know part of it is to bunker down and get ready for a, a you know, difficult winter, uh, high prices, et cetera. But um, it, it seems to me like their solution to market issues is uh, govern government mandated, uh, you know, almost like curveballs at the market. So mm -hmm. uh, definitely something to, to consider as well. Yeah, um, I had a tweet just uh, yesterday, I believe, where I was saying that the, uh, they're technocrats. So they see all problems like a technocrat, it's all a management problem. Uh, any problem that their people have and their economy has, it's, it's a challenge to their management ability. If you just read like the WEF, every single like main word in all their sentences is all about management, right? So they are technocrats through and through, Marxist technocrats, but uh, they look at everything as, oh, we can manage this. And we saw this in COVID. I mean, we're seeing the exact same rhetoric with uh, uh, von der Leyen, the president well, of the, the curve, <laughs> same exact yeah, rhetoric, same exact rhetoric. It's crazy, man. All right. So let's um, jump into the Marxism stuff from China. We've just talked about the Marxist technocrats in Europe. So now let's go Marxist over to everywhere. China. Marxists everywhere. So if you can go to slide number 10, please. I can't see if we're up because my internet's frozen. But um, we're up, sir. All right. Uh, this is just an article. I read it on my live stream. So I do live streams on Telegram. I've started simulcasting them onto Twitter spaces. So you guys can make sure you're following me at Ansel Lindner on Twitter and the spaces will come up. Um, there, there's a few hiccups. The space uh, Twitter doesn't work very well. Twitter spaces on my phone. So, you know, I'm still trying to work through some issues. But um, we went through this article. And because someone pointed out to me on my telegram, they said, uh, China's not really communist. And I was like, are you serious? So I had to pull up this article and I started reading it. And that's why I just wanted to read a few highlights from you guys. So if we go to the uh, slide number 11 on the bicentennial of Marx's birthday last May. So this is an article from 2018. So that was the bicentennial of Marx's birthday last May. Uh, President Xi Jinping called on members of the Chinese Communist Party to return to the study of the socialist sage. Quote, we commemorate Marx in order to pay tribute to the greatest thinker in the history of mankind, Xi said, and also to declare our firm belief in the scientific truth of Marxism, end quote. Party members are required to study selections of Marx's work, uh, particularly the Communist Manifesto. The public gets its dose as well, among other things, via a television talk show named Marx Got It Right. The renamed embrace of uh, the renewed embrace of Marxism has also been a key element in the rollout of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. That's a long, long term, which was added to China's constitution following last year's 19th Communist Party Congress. So we're coming up on the 20th Party Congress now. Xi Jinping is supposed to be getting his unprecedented third term as premier. And they added his communist, uh, the Xi's communist manifesto to the country's constitution. So this is definitely a Marxist country. Okay, let's continue to number 12, slide number 12. Mao put China in the middle of a world revolution to liberate the laboring masses and put the party at the core of every activity in China. Mao's ideological state uh, welded Chinese society together as the People's Republic of China, but at a terrible cost in blood and treasure. After the death of Mao in the mid-1970s, 
Deng Xiaoping appeared to break with this internationalist tradition by creating, quote, socialism with Chinese characteristics, end quote, a new policy that put economic growth ahead of revolution. And that's what everyone talks about. Oh, we, they changed. They're not communists anymore. They changed to capitalists now. But let's read on. This was a reaction to Mao's cultural revolution when ideology was taken to absurd ex extremes and plunged China into 10 years of political chaos. But Deng did not mean to abandon ideology, only to set it aside while developing the nation as fast as possible. Deng's choice to prioritize economic development over ideological conformity worked so well that socialist ideology could not keep up with the market society that emerged. So I've said this uh, other times on the show that for a communist revolution, communists actually believe in capitalism, but they believe capitalism is a phase in take, you know, the, the revolution. So first the cap, uh, capitalism will deplete itself and then the communists take over. Well, China realized Deng Xiaoping realized that there was no capitalist phase. So let's open up and have a capitalist phase so that we can then have a second communist revolution. All right. Going to slide number 13. Economic success produced its own contradictions. China has become a pluralist society that Mao Zedong could not have imagined, although not one that embraces a diversity of political or cultural views. First, television, then the internet brought the world to China, despite pervasive censorship. Globalization brought foreign tourists, students, and business people to China in huge numbers and sent Chinese abroad to study, travel, and trade. Relaxations of the Hukoi, that's the internal passport system, allowed hundreds of millions of peasants to migrate to the cities for work. By, two, by 2000, China had its share of globe-trotting capitalists, alienated intellectuals, internet-addicted teenagers, scrappy entrepreneurs, and forgotten masses. By uh, 2012, when Xi Jinping came to power, the party was afraid that this was getting out of control. A truly ideological regime cannot embrace pluralism without admitting the possibility of competition and eventual replacement. Christian, you can stop me anytime, but I got two more slides or three more slides. <laughs> oh, man, it's fascinating. Uh, it's just like, you know, I, I feel like we've been talking about this, but it's great to, you know, get it directly from uh, from G's writing, uh, you know, not too long ago, pre pre crisis, too. Absolutely. Yeah, and coming up, we here we have an expert from China, and he is translating Xi Jinping thought for us. So um, let's read on. Xi Jinping and the CCP have responded to the increasing social and intellectual pluralism that China's economic development and engagement with the world have produced with a renewed commitment to Marxism. This state Marxism is the necessary software that enables China's Leninist state to survive and to deliver on its promises today making China Marxist again, they believe. So uh, I think that's a play. This was written in 2018. And I think that's a play on words from, you know, the Trump make America great again. So they say making China Marxist again, they believe will ensure that the CCP continues to determine the content and direction of China's rejuven rejuvenation to the status of world power abroad and prosperous civilized society at home. This is Xi Jinping's China Dream, the nationalist slogan he coined that can now be found on billboards throughout the country. Next slide. One such apologist for Xi is Zhang Shigong, a law professor at Beijing University. In a recent article that drew a lot of attention in China, Zhang sought to systemize Xi Jinping thought. His argument is basically historical, providing a new periodization of modern and contemporary Chinese thought that restores the party to its central role. China stood up under Mao Zedong, got rich under Deng Xiaoping, and is becoming powerful under Xi Jinping. This seemingly simple formula, in fact, accomplishes a number of key objectives. First, it refutes the commonly held view that the history of the first 60 years of the People's Republic should be seen as divided between 30 years of failure, Maoism, and 30 years of success, reform and, and opening by arguing that Mao restored the sovereignty necessary to China's material progress in a globalized world 
under Deng. Similarly, Deng's reforms not only are not to be criticized for promoting capitalism, he simply allowed the material base for China's rejuvenation to develop. Jiang's argument thus makes China's modern and contemporary history whole and continuous. Second, Zhang identifies great men with great accomplishments, thus striking a symbolic blow against pluralism and carving out a space for Xi Jinping, his thought, and uh, possible lifelong tenure. So they're talking about lifelong tenure back in 2018, you know, way before this party Congress comes up. And third, Zhang makes a robust case for the centrality of Marxism after years of tired efforts to salvage it. And then one more paragraph here, guys. Zhang's argument requires a certain ledger domain, and that means like uh, uh, hand tricks or tricky uh, sleight of hand. That's what I'm looking for, which uh, leaves Marxism transformed. Zhang argues, as did Mao Zedong, that Marxism's truth is not timeless, but must evolve. Oh, sorry, that Marxism's truths are not timeless, but must evolve with society. Class struggle was appropriate under Mao, given China's social conditions, but not now. The ideological relaxation announced by socialism by, with Chinese characteristics under Dao, uh, Deng Xiaoping worked because by then China required, above all, the development of its material base. At present, however, China has become a well-off society that provides for the needs of its people, and Marxism requires modification to catch up with the developments of China's economy. Agreeing with new Confucians, okay, I'll just stop there. Um, I, I want to point out that cultural Marxism that we hear from in, in the United States, you know, um, I listen to a lot of James Lindsay's stuff. He's an expert on cultural Marxism, and they constantly are messing with the language. They're constantly messing with history, rewriting history as some narrative that gets them to the promised land of you know, cultural Marxism utopia. And that's exactly what China has done. Okay. So um, if people think that China is going to be successful, they have to believe that this, these, that communism works uh, and that they are uh, somehow have the right formula for central planning. And that's all for that Christian. What, what do you have to say? I mean, We've been talking about this, which is like China and Chinese government and Chinese officials, they're doing very unprecedented things in terms of that mm -hmm. no capitalistic country would do in any way, which is like huge curbs on some of its kind of key and fastest growing industry, both on the consumer side, preventing people from participating in video games and things like that, but also from the organizational side with with massive uh with massive socializations of companies, with the disappearing of key leaders and CEOs and executives, you know, discussed in there as like rogue entrepreneurs. Um, but, you know, ultimately, we're kind of almost seeing like this, like clawback of communist uh, intentions and communist, uh, uh, communist, uh, why am I blanking on the word, but just like uh, behavior uh, and central planning. Uh, and it, yeah, and it's it's the opposite of, you know, kind of what made China globally relevant. So uh, now that they're kind of moving away and they're moving back towards what made them globally irrelevant, plunge them into, you know, 10 years of darkness, as they say, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see, uh, you know, how they get to compete in a world that is less globalized and where not everyone is jumping on the communist bandwagon. So we're seeing Europe definitely doing things to slash industry and to uh, socialize and to bring down control. We're seeing that happen in, in China, but we're definitely seeing free markets trying to reign and elsewhere. Um, and uh, it's just going to be very interesting that maybe it's like Cold War 2.0, but I just don't think that these two economic ideologies can live together. Correct. And that's that's part of the deglobalization. Perhaps China will be able to survive uh, or the sorry, the CCP will be able to survive uh, in a regional hegemony, but they're not going to be this global hege the, the days of the global hegemon are now over um, the days of a global dollar system, I believe, is over. 
And that's where I like to tie in Bitcoin. I probably sound like a broken record saying this, but the between these regional multipolar world, there's not going to be a lot of trade because there's not going to be a lot of trust. Zoltan Posnar, we went through his stuff last week, and he said the same thing, that when trust breaks down, the system breaks down, globalization breaks down, trade breaks down. Well, that is where you need hard money, where you need sound money to, to trade between there because you don't need trust with Bitcoin. It's a trustless system. You just send it and you receive a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin in 10 minutes, right? So um, that is how Bitcoin, I think, that it's, it's a beautiful theory. <laughs> it is a theory, but it's beautiful that this system is going to break down and Bitcoin is just going to be able to slide into being this reserve, this global reserve. So, um, yeah, that's all, that's all the new stuff I have today. Did you want to, I was hoping maybe to take questions from the audience. What do you think about that? Or do you have anything to add to that Christian? Well, yeah, I would say if you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching on Twitch, if you're watching on Rumble, please throw in your comments. We are watching comments here. We can respond to them. And yeah, I mean, again, when you hear people saying that the U.S. is going down and China is this new rising power, this idea that's that's talked about a lot is Trippin's paradox. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what what? Uh, but and you even see the likes of Ray Dalio talking about that. I think Antel has frequently made points that uh, very accurately and uh, facts based show why if you believe that markets matter and markets will will lead to the end result that you can't possibly believe that china and the direction that it is going can compete so there's a paradox there i agree i think the the true market technology the true market force that is now emerging as the u.s dollar system is declining is bitcoin not china uh and honestly like yeah. For for the globe, Bitcoin might be the most out of left field thing that possibly could have happened. Right. Yeah. I'm sure that the CCP 20 years ago, you know, in their on their their bingo card of what could ruin our rise uh, and bringing global communism to the world. They did not see, you know, distributed ledger technology, proof of work <laughs> and Bitcoin as being the things that would take down and foil you know, their plans. And even still, I don't think that their plans would have worked because communism, central planning does not work in the face of markets. That's it. That's my opinion. So, and so I don't know what else you want to add here. I uh, haven't seen any good questions come up in the chat, but uh, yeah, bearish on China just because I'm bullish on markets, baby. Yeah, that was a great, great point about Bitcoin being, because all these gold bugs for years and a lot of, uh, I would say maybe anti- us pundits macro pundits you know they say the end of the dollar system is nigh and and all of this stuff well i i do agree with that to a certain degree but it's not going to be replaced by china just like you said it, the that is that system is never going to take over as global reserve currency we see it in all the statistics if you look at international transactions china has like one or two percent the chinese renminbi has like one or two percent and most of that is with Hong Kong, which they consider an international transaction. So that's not um, the the Chinese yuan is not going to become any sort of global reserve currency. Same with the ruble. It's just way, way too small. And look at the euro. We all know that the euro is headed to break up sooner rather than later, probably at this pay, at this rate. So, um, you know, the only option out there is the dollar until bitcoin until bitcoin came now bitcoin is this this thing that everybody's been waiting for to take down the dollar and i've been saying that for years that the ultimate the end game of this is bitcoin versus the dollar um and maybe we'll see that in the next five ten years uh i i you know 100 percent agree um we had a question about um what tools are needed for that future. I don't think that it's it's crazy to think that you need Bitcoin, you need things to make you more anti-fragile, more self-sovereign, and that's it. Like you don't need any crazy thing that hasn't been invented yet. Um, so just, what was, just try what, to fortify yourself, try to make yourself anti-fragile, Ansel. 
what was the question? What tools do we need other than Bitcoin to, to make it to a new system? The internet that, that would help us. I mean, um, use a VPN, um, you know, get your local, um, supply chains for your own family and your own stuff locked down, try to buy local as much as you can support, uh, local manufacturing, um, local business of all sorts. Uh, that's what I would recommend. Uh, so those would be the tools you need to make yourself a little bit more resilient against, uh, any sort of volatility in the future. Um, yeah. Buy Bitcoin, obviously. Buy no, Bitcoin, no, of don't, course. Yeah. Don't trust anyone. And it's easy to not trust anyone with Bitcoin. It's never been easier. The UX keeps getting better. So just learn about Bitcoin too. And yeah, Ansel, let's wrap. Y'all can find me at CK underscore Snarks. You can find me at Bitcoin Amsterdam. You can find me at Bitcoin Day in Nashville this Saturday. And uh, yeah, excited to come back next week. At the end of this month, we have uh, another guest, David uh, Lawton from Bitwise. So a lot of folks, uh, a lot of folks uh, coming onto the show. We obviously bring you Ansel's Alpha here, but we're also going to bring you some of the best guests in the space alongside everyone over at Bitcoin Magazine Live. Ansel, absolutely, pass it over to you. Give us a wrap. Yeah, follow me on Twitter at Ansel Linder. Also, the Telegram group is t.me forward slash Bitcoin and Markets, and sign up for the newsletter at BitcoinAndMarkets.com. That's it, guys. Thanks everybody for joining.